Welcome to Business 101. My name is Doug Lean. I'm the manager for the Office of Economic Development for the City of Auburn. And we really appreciate you taking the time to come to our program. I believe we have a great lineup of experts today. They will be presenting a wealth of information to you and your company for your future use and hopefully to get you a little bit more organized and more profitable. That's our goal. I want to thank the City of Auburn Mayor Nancy Backus and the City Council for their ongoing support for this type of programming throughout the years. We, uh, they feel very strongly that small business and business startups are the future of our community. I uh, also want to thank uh, our partnerships with the Auburn Chamber of Commerce and the Auburn Downtown Association in promoting and being involved in this type of programming and, and helping their, their members and the folks that they're involved with. At this time, I want to introduce our first speaker. Uh, his name is Tim Brockholm. Tim is a professor uh, and management consultant working out of Green River College and will be presenting uh, the title of, his title of his program will be Analyzing Market Conditions and Marketing Your Competitive Edge. Thank you. And it's actually Brock's home is, is my name. So um, appreciate you all coming out here today. And uh, thank you for, for having me and giving me the opportunity to come speak with you. Uh, my name is Tim Broxholm, as Doug had said, and I agree with him wholeheartedly when, when they say, especially in the smaller cities, um, entrepreneurship and small business is what's going to make your community thrive. We believe in that so much at Green River that we've gone through a process recently to create our own Bachelors of Applied Science in Marketing and Entrepreneurship, which we're just launching this quarter. So um, we have students joining us this quarter who are becoming marketing experts and um, growing their own business ideas through our entrepreneurship program. If that is something that you're interested in or somebody that you know is interested in, um, please, uh, please have them speak with me after our program today. That's my shameless plug right there. Um, but I'd like to get started, and, and I want to help by starting off and talking about the business environment. And the business environment operates at three real uh, significant levels for you as an entrepreneur or a small business owner. It's at the macro level, level, the micro level, as well as the uh, internal level. And I'll start with the big macro level. And really what we need to understand at the macro level are there are things that go on globally, nationally, uh, at the state level, and locally. And what we need to think about is the impact that that will have on our business and be aware of what's going on and look for challenges as well as opportunities. And so I want to give you some kind of... Uh, areas that I would, I would focus on. First, I would look at the political landscape of, of either your local political landscape, your state political landscape, and even the national one. And try to determine what are, what's going on at that level and how could that potentially impact your business. And that could be from um, anything from legislation to uh, taxes to a number of things that can happen that could and uh, may impact your business. Now, the reality is you may not have a lot of control over that, but you do have a choice on how you want to react and respond to that. And being aware and having some foresight to that and some understanding of what that means or could mean to your business will give you a little bit of an edge. Another area we want to look at is the economic landscape. So, for example, as I was coming in today, I was listening to CNBC on my uh, Sirius XM radio, and there's been a lot of talk about what's going on with oil. And we've all seen oil prices dropping and the economic impact of the supply and demand that's happening in, in the oil industry. And, yeah, that might not sound like it imp impacts you directly, but the economic impacts of that could have some, some major impact. It could impact your suppliers. It could impact your consumers. You know, if the price of gas goes down, all of a sudden that puts a few more dollars in your consumer's pocket, which may open up their ability to do business with you. And so we need to be aware of the economic conditions. We also want to put a big focus on our local economic conditions and what's going on there. So attending um, events and keeping track of data through your county websites, your city websites, and, list, and I would say reading some publications such as the Puget Sound Business Journal would be a great way to just stay apprised and aware of what's going on there. In terms of social conditions and, and the social landscape, um, this is a key area, I think, for everybody to stay aware of. And the reason for that is because this, this influences consumer behavior. 
and consumer behavior may uh, have a direct impact on your customers and your products and your services. And there's an old saying that uh, a gentleman who used to do business here in the Puget Sound, uh, his name was Bob Moad, he said, when you're green, you're grown, when you're ripe, you rot. And I think that's really true when it comes to understanding your customers. Staying green and knowing what the latest trends are is really important to staying in business and being able to adapt and change as, as needed. Technology is another piece of this. And the technology that is happening today is, is, is wonderful for small businesses and entrepreneurs. The reason for that is, is quite simple. It gives you the ability to reach more people and to brand and differentiate yourself while having the opportunity to reach a lot more consumers at a lower cost, more now than ever. And these tools that are coming online also give you an opportunity to better track data and information and metrics to keep your business successful. So making sure that you don't um, miss out on the opportunity to use technology effectively in your business. Now that, that goes to the other side of saying, making sure that uh, you don't just have the latest and greatest technology because you need to have the latest and greatest technology. There's a method for the madness. Then I would say the environmental conditions that you're operating in. And, and what I mean is the actual environment that, that's going on. Is there construction going on? Is there uh, green initiatives going on? What's going on with the environment? For example, Seattle just launched a new law. Uh, I know they're up in the way, but they, they now say that you can't throw away certain things in your garbage, right, because of an environmental piece. And that changes some of the landscape. And, and so looking for opportunities and challenges that might be in there. And lastly is the, the legal environment and staying on top of that, especially as you grow your business and, and being aware of the employment laws and the business laws. And, and some other speakers will talk more in depth on that. Now, as we look at the macro environment, um, a key piece is, is understanding who your stakeholders are. Who's invested in your business and who are you doing business for? And when it comes from put, to push to shove, who's going to be the last person standing in your business? Is it the owner? At the end of the day, are you truly thinking about your customer, because I know a lot of companies will say, oh, my stakeholders are, are customers, employees, and, um, and then maybe me. But the reality is, if it come, push some shove, are you going to lay off an employee, or are you going to do business with a customer who might not be the most ethical uh, customer or supplier? Who is your real stakeholder? So understanding that. Um, being aware of your competitors. And that doesn't mean emulating your competitors, and that doesn't mean um, trying to, to mimic them or, or whatnot, it's just being aware of your competitors and not letting them sneak up on you. Suppliers and, and ensuring that you have great supplier relationships along with continuing to manage the quality and as well as the cost of, your, of doing business through your suppliers and consistently evaluating that. I would also pay attention to your intermediaries, which means uh, where do you lie in the supply chain? Are you the retailer? Are you the wholesaler? Are you the manufacturer? And how is that, that value chain really um, put together and is it as strong as it could be? And obviously I think a, a core piece of this is the consumer. Really, like I said in the macro, but also the day-to-day -day consumers, the people that you're consistently interacting with and getting their feedback. They're your best asset when it comes to product differentiation and product development. Now, here's what you're really in control of. Um, I think entrepreneurs can learn a lot from television. And if you tune into CNBC, you may, you may have seen a show called The Profit with um, famous CEO and entrepreneur Marcus Lemonis of Camping World and Good Sam. And he says there's three things internally that we have to worry about, people, product, and process, or be aware of. And we want to make sure that we have the right people on our team. You know, we want to make sure that we're having the right products, and we want to make sure that we have the right processes and systems in play. And that's, that's, that's core to your focus in, in, for the game that you're playing. So if I were to break it down to anything that you have the most control of and that you should be consistently evaluating, it's people, product, and process. Now I want to move on to how do we apply some core focus to our business, especially as we're just getting starting up or scaling our business. And there's three areas that I think are really important. Um, first is value creation. Second would be the profit model. And third is your business logic. And so I want to provide you with some core questions as it relates to value creation. First of all, who are your customers and what is your product or service offering? Can you define that out? And I think that's really important for an entrepreneur or a small business owner to really know those things and be dialed into what that product and service is. 
And then going to the next piece, which is how does the offering create differentiated value for your customers? The reason they're doing business with you is because you are adding value. That's the whole reason you exist as a business, is to add value through your product and services. So again, I think what we need to look at then is the value chain and what part are you in? Could you take over another section of it? Do you need another partner to, to really make your product or service that much better, to add more value? So understanding where are you in the value chain. And lastly, what is your go-to-market strategy? How are you getting your product and services out there? Now, here's some opportunities for you. I love when I have my students to always give them some go-forward pieces in terms of what can they do with it or how can they compete. One area is operational excellence. Having the best processes and the best be most cost effective. What makes certain businesses better than others is just that they operate better than everybody else, and that's very much in your control. Product leadership. Wonderful thing about small business is you're very intimate with your product. You're very much in tune with what's going on as it relates to your business because you're in it every day, right? And so as a result, you can be a great um, asset in product leadership and really differentiating what you're offering compared to your competitors or substitute products. I think customer intimacy is another key characteristic that can add value. And we see this more and more. Um, as many, many people in today's consumer market want to have that relationship with a business. You can really have that relationship with the business as a small business. And it's, and it's a great way to differentiate and add value for yourself. Then we can need to take a look at the marketplace. And I see a lot of small businesses today, um, especially ones that may be in like a downtown area, they want to focus on the bricks and mortar. And they don't go to the e-commerce or vice versa. Um, they might be in e-commerce because it's the most effective at the time, but what if they had a pop-up store every now and then or got some other ways to really make that connection, that face-to-face that -face connection? So looking at what platforms you're using and, and what marketplace are you really operating in, you know, um, whether that's Amazon or Etsy or your own direct site or through um, a store, thinking about those opportunities that you might have. I keep bringing up the value chain because it is an important component to say, okay, if I have this, let's say I'm a photographer, right, and I'm shipping out my, my photography books to some other vendor to create that beautiful wedding album, and I'm giving up some value because of that, could I, or is there an opportunity for me to take that process over so that now I own both parts of that value chain? See, now you've created new opportunities for yourself, and you've added more value to your customer because now you really know what they want and need. Second set of questions. No business stays in business without making a profit. That's just the reality of it. And so there's two ways to control your profit. You increase your revenues or you effectively reduce and manage your expenses. That's how profit grows. And so you need to be thinking about what are your sources of revenue? And are there additional opportunities to get new sources of revenue? What is your cost structure? And I'm sure that some of the other speakers today will give you some ideas to thinking about, about your cost structure. And what are your key drivers of profitability? What's making you money and what's not making you money? And where are you putting your time in comparison? Lastly, and this is sometimes the most important part before you really get going on building your business if you're a startup, is what's the logic of your business? How will your business meet its profit and and growth targets. So thinking that from that strategic nature and does this business make sense? So with that being said, if you think that you could, uh, again, if you could value from some additional education or opportunities to, to learn in an applied setting, I would really encourage you to check out our Bachelors of Applied Science in Marketing and Entrepreneurship at Green River. And or if you need some help with your business, either through executive coaching or organizational development consulting, I would ask that you check out uh, my, our website at firedupculture.com. All right? I appreciate your time, and I'll be here to answer questions and, and meet with you one-on-one -on -one afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Our next speaker is going to be Mr. Kirk Davis. Kirk is going to present uh, his presentation on pitch to plan. Kirk is a... Um, uh, very knowledgeable business consultant and business educator who brings his experience from commercial lending, small business ownership, and a general manager of a national company.
Kirk is currently with the uh, SBDC, which is operated through Green River Community College for small business consulting and help. Kirk. All right, thank you. It is wonderful to be with you here today, and I want to thank Doug Lean, the City of Auburn, and the partners who helped put this together. I thought Tim gave an excellent presentation with a lot of valuable ideas and insights. <clears throat> How many of you... Uh, out of curiosity, are, are just looking at starting a business, or you're in the process of getting a business started? A couple of you. How many have you already have a business? All right. Well, I prepared information for both, and uh, and will and there's different times when a business plan can be helpful to you uh, in your business life, and so uh, hopefully the information on how to start a business plan or how to write a business plan will be helpful. Uh, I if you uh, let's see, maybe I can go to the next slide here. Okay. Um, let's see. Oops, I'm going the wrong way, huh? This way, okay. Just a little bit about me. Um, I've had a chance to work at Green River Community College in the SBDC Small Business Development Center for the last 10 years. And previous to that, I was a business banker with U.S. Bank and Bank of America. And businesses would come to me for funding, and I would say, well, I really can't get you a loan until we have a business plan with financial projections. And... Uh, I would have grown men actually cry because they couldn't put a business plan together. Say, I could build a house from scratch. They said, I can't put together a business plan. So it became kind of a quest for me to figure out how to help entrepreneurs do this business planning process. And um, I'll just mention that this last year I've had an opportunity to teach a lot of classes on business. I, taught, I, I was just, you know, you get to the end of the year and you're re reviewing your year. But I had a chance to teach over 45 different business topics this last year. And I, I get a chance to work with 100 to 150 different businesses face-to-face. -face. And I want to mention that our SBDC program at Green River Community College offers free business advising. So if, and, and we actually meet with businesses right here in Auburn. So if, if you have a desire to meet with us, uh, there's a handout. You are, did you already get the handout to them? My contact information and website and email address are on, on that handout. And if you are in a position where you would like just a sounding board, some free business advice, we're very happy to meet with you. There's myself and Partik Singh, uh, who are certified business advisors. But we have a passion for business. We read it. We study it. But then we get to work with real people. So we get the combination of the theoretical and the, and the actual. See if I do the right way here. What you're seeing here is a business startup map. And when, often I'm working with new startup businesses. They, they just don't understand quite the terrain that they have to navigate. So I'll, I'll kind of guide you step by step through this. Uh, as entrepreneurs, and I hope we're never done with this, but our, our business always starts with an idea. And as I watch businesses grow and mature and get better and better and better, that, I notice that that idea process for their business never ends. And it seems like we as entrepreneurs are really always looking. We're, we feed on new ideas. So we're reading the blogs, reading the magazines, we're searching websites. And if you're like me on Facebook, I've, I've liked, uh, you know, Inc. Magazine, Fast Company Magazine, Entrepreneur. So I get all these uh, business insiders, really fun for me. So I get all of this stuff right on my uh, business stuff, right on my feed. And I'm always saving an article, saving an article, saving an article, and looking at how I can incorporate it. But we as entrepreneurs are always looking for ideas. We're trying to uh, build and learn from other people's successes and failures so that we can achieve our goals and our dreams and our vision. That's stage one. Stage two, most important stage research and homework. So you've got your vision, you've got your idea, you, you know what you're doing or what you want to do, but uh, like Tim mentioned, you're never really done understanding your product, you're never done understanding your customers, and then I'll say your numbers, and we're going to get some more presentations on that. So, so homework, homework, homework. Uh, I, w I was just talking to Steve from, from Auburn Library, and I refer people oftentimes to the King County Library databases. I have so many stories of brilliant insights and fantastic research and knowledge that's available through the King County Library for free. Mm -hmm. People are shocked at what they can learn and how it helps them make much better business decisions. So I highly, you know, it seems like if companies are making mistakes, it's typically in this research piece. Now, in the business um, progression here, you're going to take all of that research and put it into a business plan. And that's going to, going to be the next part of my talk is how to formulate all of that research into a business plan. But the reason why we're doing business plans typically is to raise money. I've worked with entrepreneurs to uh, bank, you know, uh, 
bank loans are number one. SBA guaranteed loans are number two. Uh, getting uh, investment money from investors is number three, helping businesses put that together. So I'm, I'm working with entrepreneurs to help them put together the business plan, the bank application, or the presentation to the bank and the SBA, or helping them put together a pitch for, for investors. And it's a lot like Shark Tank, except in real life. I guess they're real life too, but uh, we, do it, we, we have to do it sometimes the harder way. But before we go for the money, which is number five on the checklist, we want to go through the protection stage. And, and we, we're going to have a wonderful presentation about that today. So before we get to asking for the money, I want to make certain that we, we have incorporated the business, that we have uh, done our trademarks, that we've done our copyrights, our patents, anything that we need to do to protect the assets of your business. It is really, truly a privilege that we live in a country where the laws that, that protect your ownership of your company are enforced. Uh, there are countries where that doesn't happen, and they cannot, they cannot build wealth in those countries. So the fact that our ownership rights are enforced, uh, I've had companies who get a cease and desist letter because their name locally is very similar to a nationally trademarked company. And we've at, we, talk, we talk to the attorney and say, oh, yeah, you have to change your name. You, have to, you must cease and desist operating with that name because the national trademark is actually protected. So once we get you all protected and set up, then we go for the funding. Now, in this entire process of writing your business plan, doing your homework, you've started a business checkup list. I want to just share, uh, I have a lot of stories to tell, you, to tell you the truth, but one of them is a new company that's going to be opening up in the Kent Covington area, right? Do you guys know where the new Trader Joe's is over on Kent Kangley Road? Uh, there's a new business going there called Pi Lab, <clears throat> and it's a, it's a wonderful story, a wonderful entrepreneur. I just met with her this morning. But anyway, she has leased the space right next to Trader Joe's. She's 20 steps. Her door is 20 steps away from Trader Joe's. Just before Christmas, I stopped at Trader Joe's in, in, my, in my community. I live in a university place. And asked them, how many transactions do you do a month? And it turns out, on average, they, showed, they were happy to share the numbers. They, on average, do about 50,000 transactions a month. And so I said to her this morning, I said, well, you know, uh, how many ovens do you have? What's the capacity of your business? To, I mean, how many people do you think will take 20 steps from Trader Joe's over to a pie bakery? So anyway, we're pretty excited about that. Uh, location, 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 right, for success. But she's been doing her startup checklist. We've been working on some of the things that Tim's been talking about, operational excellence, how she's going to operate. We're going to work through uh, staffing, staffing companies to actually make certain that we have the right talent. Because as I've watched small businesses go and grow, a lot of times they go through huge transitions with staff because they didn't quite hire the right people. So again, people, processes, product that, that Tim talked about. So once we get the funding, we've got the startup checklist in number six. That's, that seems like sometimes the most painful part, getting the building, getting your website, getting your business cards, getting all the legalities, getting your accounting, bookkeeping all set up. But once we get you all set up, we're, we're in something that a Harvard professor called the first mile stage. The first mile stage is break even. <clears throat> so our question is, from a financial standpoint, how do we go through the numbers, through the financial projections, do the thing that, that Tim was talking about with revenue? How do we, you know, what's going to drive our revenue? What's going to be really controlling our costs, or how do we control our costs, so that we can maximize that profit and hit that break even point as quickly as possible? Some of you may have heard the rumors uh, that it takes up to sometimes five years to get profitable in a business. I really don't even like businesses to go more than three months without a profit. So we work very closely with financial projections. And so I'll meet people who are really excited about their startup. They're a little bit nervous. And I'll say, have you, because I know when they're nervous, they have not done their financial projections. So have you done them? No. So we, we get together and we actually work through the financial projections. And then they, they can calm down, settle down, and say, OK, I need this many customers to get to my break even point by this point. But now, before you hit break even, you're in a mode called the cash burning mode. And there's something that uh, investors call the burn rate. Mm -hmm. What is your burn rate on cash before you break even? After you break even, now we're into something called the build rate. And that is, how fast are you building cash? And the whole idea is to have, I've worked with so many businesses that are flat broke or going out of business. I have story after story of, of businesses that came to me because their attorney, their accountant had told them, that you're done, you're finished. And I asked them this question. They're exhausted, they're tired, they've been through everything. And I said, do you have any fight left in you? 
The answer is yes, they do. And we work them around through you know, close financial projections, close financial management, good marketing practices, good operational practices, back to this place stage aid of growth because we get them back into having cash build up in their accounts. They reinvest that to increase the capacity of their business. But then they really achieve the realization of the vision that they started out with in stage one. So I'd like to go to the oops, next uh, slide here to show you a quick way to write a business plan. I was just talking to one of my colleagues. There are 26 SBDC advisors like myself in the state of Washington. And I, I was asking him, how long is it taking your clients to write a business plan? He said, too long. And as a banker, my experience was it was taking six to eight months for most people to write a business plan. And when I started at the SBDC, I found that same process. So I was researching, you know, what is the way to do this? And I came across a couple of great information, a couple of sources of great information. One was this idea that you see on the top here, pitch then plan. And that the other one was a book written by Guy Kawasaki, if you've, I don't know if you've heard of him, but it's called Art of the Start. And he also recommends the same process. He's probably got the best information on it that I could find on, online or in books. But the idea is that you're going to actually create your, your investor pitch, if you will, before you create your business plan. So many people get in trouble because they write their business plan to the best of their ability. It's still pretty much crap. That's a technical term. <laughs> and... And then they can do their financial projections and go, oh, wait, I'm not making any money. And they go through this four to six month process of tweaking the financials, tweaking the business plan. It's so much easier to tweak a PowerPoint. <clears throat> so you'll see that I have instructions in the handout that I've given you. Uh, if I could just have somebody from the audience just read point one. What is point one there? Go ahead. Do your research. Do your research. This is all about your understanding of your business. What do the numbers say? What does, what does the... There's a website that I use a lot uh, to help me understand customers. It's thinkwithgoogle.com, where Google is sharing. I, I have a saying, Google knows everything, and Facebook knows everybody. So I actually use Facebook ads to study market, market spaces, and I use Google, thinkwithgoogle.com, to, to study um, almost everything there is to know about business. But Google shares what they know about your industry, about your company, about your product, and your competitors, and your marketplace right on thinkwithgoogle.com. Very amazing stuff. Research, research, research. Number two on the list. Anybody? Yeah. Create a PowerPoint. So we're going to use these headings to create a PowerPoint heading. Uh, I'll just uh, share that um, a couple guys starting a restaurant. Restaurants are really hard to get started. You have to have an investor. Most banks won't invest. But we built a PowerPoint based on these 10 topics. and. Well, after we built it, I thought it was good. I didn't hear from them again. And that happens to me a lot. You know, we get you going. You guys are just too busy to, to check back home. But uh, three years later, somebody said, hey, I'm headed to this restaurant in Seattle. I said, really? Uh, and so I called them up. They go, yeah, we got the fun. We got the money. We got the investment. Thanks to your presentation. We're doing great. So it's really fun. But these headings are answer the major questions that an investor has or a bank or the SBA. So what this does is it tells the story of how and why you're going to be successful. All right, somebody would read that third, third bullet point. No more than four, no more than four, three is ideal. No more than four bullet points per slide. We're giving, what does it say right after that? The, the 30,000 foot view, the eagle's eye view or the top of the mountain view. We're just giving them a very broad look. In your presentation, when you're presenting this to a bank or, or presenting this to investors, you are talking through the entire business plan. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Guy Kawasaki will say that these presentations to an investor shouldn't be any more than 20 minutes. Short, concise, and you can do that because you have, um, you have pictures, which I, was is that the next point? Somebody see the next point there? Easily picture, picture, uh, so... Pictures that tell the story of the slide are everything. There's a saying that a picture is, is worth a thousand words and a story is worth a thousand pictures. So when you get up there and you talk through your presentation and you're telling the stories and you're showing the pictures and you have these three or four bullet points, it is a very powerful, very persuasive presentation. I can't remember where I wrote it on there, but the purpose of this presentation is to what?
you want to inspire so much trust that people will actually invest in you. So I'll tell you the good news uh, with this. Using this, pro this process, most of my clients have been able to write their business plan in one to two weeks. And I would say that 90% of the presentations that we've given to bankers and investors and potential partners in their business, uh, they have never asked for the business plan. So I've told my clients recently, do this executive presentation. If they want a business plan, tell them, I'll have it to you in a week. But a lot of times we can get away without actually writing a detailed business plan. When we get down to number nine on the, or number eight on the financial projections, we actually hand them a packet, which is the resumes of the team on number seven. We hand them a packet of the resumes, and then we have them a full financial uh, projection with financial assumptions, and that answers the major questions that a banker or that uh, an investor has. And then if they want to see more or see something more in writing, it, it, like say a week to 10 days, you've probably got this uh, written out. I'll just mention in closing that I was with a group of these SBDC advisors and uh, they, they asked the, the question, how long is it taking your clients, or we were asking each other, how long is it taking your clients to write a business plan? We had the standard six to eight month time frame, And I, I said, well, one to two weeks, but they thought I was joking. And so uh, nobody really believed me. But one guy pulled me aside and said, how are you helping businesses write business plans so fast? And I showed him this process, and he's been using it very successfully ever since. I wish all of you a lot of success. I hope to see you in the future. I wish you a bright and successful 2015 and beyond. And I uh, look forward to our question and answer session. Thank you, Kirk. Very good. Our third speaker is going to be uh, Mr. Clinton uh, Wilcock. Uh, Clinton is a, an attorney with a local law firm, uh, Saget Law Offices here on Main Street. He's going to talk to us uh, on a very important subject and uh, answer the question of what do you want to be when you grow up. <laughs> Clinton is a licensed uh, attorney to practice law in the state of Washington. Uh, he is also holds a, I believe, is it a master or doctorates in taxation? Master in taxation. Masters in uh, taxation from the University of uh, Washington Law School and has also worked in retail banking and retail. Clinton, thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, so when I, when I talk to somebody who's in the position where they're starting up a business frequently, they've already gone through the kind of steps that Kirk's talked about. And now their, their concern is just, well, let's get the legal stuff nailed down so I can get busy. And, and most of the time we can help them once they have the decisions make, made to get this thing done very rapidly. But when they start asking me, okay, so this is what it is we're going to be doing. Um, yeah, what kind of business entity should I be looking at? The first question that usually comes out of my mouth is, well, what does your accountant say? <laughs> and sometimes I get the blank stare and they start, well, well what, what does the accountant have to do anything to do with it? And I tell them, you have the opportunity now to decide just how much you're going to pay in taxes and for what reasons. You know, when we start talking about the entities, really the, the legal decisions are very clear cut. But there can be some very, very serious tax considerations that may say we turn right instead of left when we're, we're making these decisions. So if they haven't already hooked up with an accountant, we usually have three or four that we can recommend. And we'll even make the introductions if they have to. And once they get that settled, then we sit down and we, we start going through these considerations. And typically, the first choice that you run into is a sole proprietorship. Um, I don't recommend these. <laughs> Basically, you, what you've done with a sole proprietorship is you've made a decision to really not set up any entity. And from a legal standpoint, that's the kind of thing that makes members of my tribe pull out their hair and start screaming because <laughs> you've just set yourself up with enormous liabilities. And I, I've even dealt with some businesses where people start saying, well, you know, I, I really don't think that my liability is going to be that great. You know, I, I have a dog walking business. Okay, you have a dog walking business, but something to consider is you've also got this home that you've paid for. You know, you, you own it outright. Maybe that's the only real asset you own other than this build, business that you're trying to build. And I can talk to you about any sort of parade of horribles that would come up. That, and, and you might think that some of them might get extreme, but Really, they're not. In, in 12 years of practice, I've seen an awful lot of things that you just would never think would be the sequence of events, and it's exactly what happened. So maybe you're out walking 
you know, Susie Smith's prized Pomeranian one day, and you're in the crosswalk, this, the signal's with you, but now you've got a drunk driver who comes through. Well, you managed to get out of the way, but the dog didn't. Well, you, you'd think that maybe your liability shouldn't be so much on this, but frequently in, in a situation like that, you've got people who have very strong emotional attachments, and as soon as you start talking about strong emotional attachments, you're also talking about big dollar signs that somebody, usually a member of my tribe, sees when they hear about what happened. <laughs> so um, while you can certainly protect yourself with insurance, it's not the complete package because even if you have the, the highest level of liability coverage that you can get, insurance companies will find ways to not pay on claims. They will find ways to not defend on claims. And that's not a knock on them. They, they have a business to run just like everybody else. And, you know, things happen where, for whatever reason, maybe you, didn't, you weren't covered for what happened or, or something similar, which is why the liability protection is important. And a sole proprietorship simply doesn't give that to you. The next choice, you know, if you're doing business with somebody else, then maybe what you're considering is a partnership. Um, they can be very complex. Um, you can run into a situation where you never intended to have a partnership, but because nobody really intended anything and nobody took the steps to set anything up, now you're in a partnership by default. And the problem with partnerships are is the liability for what's done by your partner is also your liability. There are some variations on that that you can choose to put yourself into, maybe a limited liability partnership, but then there are limitations on who can do what in those kind of arrangements. And again, if, if it's a business, maybe it's two guys who have a fly fishing shop that they opened up together, they, they generally want to be able to have the same amount of control worked out between both of them. So from that point, we usually go ahead and move on to the more preferred choices. And I've, I've broken corporations into two separate uh, designations here. The first and, and the one that most people think of when they think of businesses and corporations would be a C corporation. Um, typically, this is for a larger company. Uh, maybe they have, they're publicly traded, so they have more than 75 shareholders. That's usually the limit. Again, there are some variations on this, but not too many. The, the thing that makes a C corporation be a not so attractive a choice for a lot of businesses, especially small businesses, is the double taxation consideration. And what that means is there's money that you pay in taxes for the money that the corporation makes, and then the money that comes to you gets taxed also. Uh, again, uh, I do have a few small businesses who, for other considerations, really have decided to choose to be a C corporation. But for most small businesses, I don't recommend it. The nice thing about corporations is that as long as you observe the formalities that are required by law, you get to have some liability protection. So your personal assets are still your personal assets. So if somebody decides to sue you for something that you've done in the course of your business, or maybe something you haven't done, they get to go after the corporate assets. And as long as you've observed those formalities, which are typically having your annual meetings of the shareholders and the board of directors, and then having those recorded in minutes, that's the number one way that people get around that liability protection is when that doesn't happen. So when we set up, it, with our office, when we set people up with corporations, we also set ourselves up as the registered agent and we send them reminders every year when they're supposed to have their meetings. And when we send them the reminder, we also send them the worksheet. So they can fill everything out, send it back to us, we type it up, we send it back to them, it gets signed, it gets dated, and it goes in the corporate book that we keep. <laughs> that way, when that day comes, when the knock on the door and there's a process server there, we've just shut down the easiest way that somebody can use to get the personal assets. Now, the more common one that we end up using for an S Corp, or for small businesses is an S corporation. Um, this is because it has passed through taxation. The money that's being made gets taxed only once and that's when it goes into your hands. Now again, depending on how much money you're making, how successful you are, 
there may be some reasons to not do this, but this is going to be the most popular choice. And again, as long as you observe the formalities, you've got a pretty solid lock on liability protection when you use this. The final type of entity that we, we will talk to people about is a limited liability company. And despite the name limited liability company, this is actually a species of partnership. It's kind of one of these weird little hybrids. It's actually under the, the partnership section of the RCWs as its own separate subchapter. Uh, you can have an LLC with just one member, which is one of the things that, it, like I said, it's, it's the weird hybrid kind of deal. But typically, I like, one of the things I really like about the LLCs is we don't have the annual requirements for meetings that typically you have for corporations. This, this makes governance a whole lot more easy for business owners, especially with small business owners. We find, you know, it, you've got enough just keeping your business running and keeping your hands full, managing staff, whatever. Keeping up on these things, even when we're helping you, can be very difficult. And if, if this is the right option that you've worked out with your CPA, this is really much, much easier to run. Now, one of the things that I do caution people about is you will hear a lot of lawyers say that it has the exact same liability protection as a corporation. Um, my response when I hear something like that is maybe. <laughs> and the reason I say maybe is we do not have the same body of case law backing up LLCs that we do with corporations especially regarding this question. It's, it's really more of an assumed thing. I, I've never seen a case where it's actually been tested, but because it's never actually been tested, I can't tell people that with 100% certainty. But really, you know, once you make these choices, um, there are other things that we'd love to help people with. You know, sometimes you have to sit down and actually work out an employee manual because you've got staffing issues and people are different and there are ways that you want to try to make things uniform for the business. Um, at some point you're going to be leasing space before you actually build or buy on your own if that's something that you're working towards. Um, reviewing commercial leases, I love to do it and I realize that sounds very strange, but it's, it's kind of like where's Waldo for me. I get to sit down and, and kind of pick out all the gotchas, and that's what I do. I, I sit down with them, and I get out my notepad and my pencil, and I may take an hour and a half reading a 30-page lease, but by the time I'm done, I've got three or four pages of notes of things that you might have picked up on and you might not have picked up on. Again, you, you guys are busy people. You're trying to run your business. This is why you came to me. Um, and the, the other side of that is a lot of times landlords aren't really thinking about what you're telling them when you're saying you're interested in renting the space for your business and you talk about, okay, what is it that you do? So occasionally you run into the situation where you're going to have somebody who, who has, say, a hazardous materials clause in there that's a basic hazardous materials clause, but they're going to rent the space to a, a nail salon. And I've told business owners, you can't sign this lease. The minute you sign this lease, you're in violation. Right? Read that hazardous materials clause. You guys use stuff all the time that falls right under this. So it, it's helpful to have me involved from the start. It helps you avoid problems later on. And <coughs> obviously, the first place we start is in your entity choice. Thank you. Thank you, Clinton. That was very informative. Our next speaker <coughs> is going to be Maria Bagoshis. Uh, Maria is a, an associate with a local CPA firm, Fitchett, Benedict, and Clark here in Auburn. Uh, she's going to talk about the very important subject of where did my pennies go. Uh, Maria is a QuickBooks uh, certified pro advisor, has 19 years experience in um, teaching and the uh, uh, use of uh, that type of accounting system. She also teaches accounting at Green River Community College. Uh, Maria. Thank you, Doug. Um, as he said, I do work for a local CPA firm, and one of the things we are just spearheading is the new creation of a uh, small business bookkeeping, um, mostly focused on QuickBooks. I have um, 19 years of experience with just QuickBooks, and in the past 19 years, I've done a lot of consulting, helping small businesses get set up, 
helping them set up their accounting system and also addressing a lot of these issues that our um, first speakers have talked about. Um, and I do, as you said, I teach a, a continuing education class for Green River. I've been teaching there for 14 years and uh, the class is small business or QuickBooks for small business. Um, one of the, let's see, oh, there we go. Um, so I could, because I've been teaching, I can talk for hours. Um, so I have tried to focus it down to 10 questions to ask yourself. If you are a person starting a small business, what are the 10 things that you should ask, ask yourself? And let's see. Okay. And Clinton gave a great presentation on entity type. One of the first things that when somebody comes to me, I ask them, well, what's your entity type? And if they look at me with this blank stare, I said, you need to do some more research. Let me know and come back. This is very important. As he talked about the liability and so forth, but really it's a big part of it is the taxes. Um, wages versus distributions. I've explained to some small business owners who may be a sole proprietor or a partnership. I said, did you ever think about um, incorporating and becoming an S Corp? Uh, I said, do you know how much tax you could save by doing that? And when I sit down and crunch the numbers and give them a rough idea, they're amazed. Um, also self-employment tax. If you're a sole proprietor, you're going to be paying self-employment tax. That means you pay all of your payroll taxes, not just half of them out of the deduction of your payroll. Um, a lot of people don't understand how the whole payroll um, concept works, especially when you're a corporate officer. And the tax rates. Um, if you have a good financial planner or a good CPA that can sit down with you, you can have them work up some numbers for you because you want to have a combined overall uh, picture of your financial situation, both your business and your personal. So they can find the best balance for you as far as how much wages to take, how to minimize your taxes, both in payroll taxes, corporate taxes, and your personal income taxes. Um, if you're just starting a business, you may not know what agencies you have to um, register with. And one of the things that I find out people don't know a lot about is there's a definite order you have to do this in. I've had people make this mistake where they, they start out with the wrong agency and then they have to go back and redo it. So the thing to remember is you always need to start out registering your business with the Secretary of State. You have to check and see if that name that you have chosen is available or not. If it is, then you register your name. Then you can move forward. The next thing to, um, the next agency to call is the IRS. You can download an SS4 form off of their website. You can uh, fill it out and it's a request for an EIN number, number. Okay? And that way you now have your federal ID number. That's where your federal taxes will be reported. Uh, the third one is Department of Revenue. That's the state of Washington. Now, they will assign you a UBI number, Unified Business Number. And that number is going to be the number you use when you report your sales. And um, when you fill out the master business application, it used to be Department of Licensing, it's Department of Revenue now that handles that. They will ask you, do you plan on having employees? And if you answer yes, they will very nicely notify L&I, Labor and Industries, and also Employment Security. And you will automatically be set up with all three of those. And they will send you your information in mail. Then the next step would be now you're ready to go to the bank and open up a bank account. Because the bank is going to want to have your EIN number, your federal tax ID number. They're going to want to have your UBI number. And if you, um, depending on how you set up your business, they may ask for a certificate of formation. So you want to make sure you do those things in that order so you're not going back and having to redo steps. Okay? Um, the next thing is your county. Okay, a lot of people miss this, and this is a big um, catch for some people, is you have to register with your county for your personal property taxes. And I see people that miss this one all the time. So make sure you check with whatever county you're in 
and find out what your requirements aren't there so you don't get surprised someday. Um, also, some cities, a lot more of them, local cities, they're starting to have their own small um, B&O tax, business and occupation tax. So you want to make sure you find out the requirements for the city you're in. Okay. The next one is, will I hire employees or operate the business by myself? Okay. Well, one of the considerations is you really need to think about what kind of responsibilities I'm, is, am I going to take on if I decide to hire employees? How are payroll taxes calculated? If you're going to pay somebody $15 an hour, what's it really costing you? You need to really understand the payroll tax system. Um, also, labor laws and liability. And a lot of that information you can find on Labor of Industries website. They have a lot of good resources there. Okay. Um, should I set my accounting system up on cash or accrual? Um, I'm really surprised at how many people start business, they've been running their business, and I ask them this and they don't know. Well, how do you not know? Well, most, first of all, you want to know what the difference is. A cash-based business is when you register or record your income based on when your customers pay you. That's the date that you make the money. And on the flip side, the date that you pay your expenses is the day you record them. An accrual basis is when it's date document driven. Okay? So what is the date of the invoice that you gave that customer? That's the day you record the income, whether they have paid you or not. And I have seen some companies just about go under because they made that incorrect choice. On the flip side, for accrual basis, you acknowledge your expense on the date of the bill, not the day you actually pay it. Okay? And, um, you know, I had one client several years ago who he was on the verge of bankruptcy because somebody had given him poor advice, told him he had to be on an accrual basis, and he had to take out a line of credit just to pay his taxes. So um, if anybody has made that mistake, you can recover from it. We did help him to do that, and in about, it took him about three months, but he was able to close the line of credit and actually have positive cash flow. So make sure you understand that and how it affects your business. If you have a business that has inventory, you're probably going to have to be on an accrual basis. But that's one of the things to talk to your accountant about. How much accounting knowledge do I need to start a successful business and operate it? Well, it depends on what your business is. How big do you want to be? Um, but the most, one of the most important things is when you do run a business, do you know what the difference between a balance sheet and a profit and loss statement is? Do you know how to read a cash flow statement? Do you know how the three things integrate? And for those of you that already know the answers to that, you'll probably get a kick out of this. I had this one client, and it seemed like every year I would give him his profit and loss statement. He says, I couldn't have made that much money. I don't have anything in my bank account. So we have to sit down and say, okay, this is a balance sheet. This is a profit and loss. And oh, yeah, now I remember. So you really want to understand that. As a business owner, you need to know how to read your own financial statements. Okay? And let's go to the next screen. Do I know the filing requirements with Washington State Department of Revenue for reporting sales in my industry? And is my industry required to collect sales tax and remit it? Okay, some businesses, even if you're a service business, there are some service businesses in the state of Washington who have to charge sales tax on their services. It's not just about product. So you need to do the research, just like you know, these gentlemen were talking about. You need to do your research and your homework and find out what taxes am I going to have to pay. Now, the state of Washington, they charge, if you have to pay sales tax, you pay the tax on your gross sales, not your net profit. So you could be losing money and still have to pay your taxes to the Department of Revenue. You also need to do some research as far as what category do I have to report in. You may have to report in multiple categories. You may have to make sure you set up your accounting system so it divides up your sales into the right categories so you don't have this really painful process of trying to prepare a return. 
Um, you want to know what, um, if you're entitled to any specific deductions. For example, one that a lot of people don't know about, if you manufacture or supply any kind of materials to the aerospace industry, there's a small business tax credit for that. And a lot of people, you know, leave it on the table. Um, do you qualify for a small business credit? If you're a small enough company and your sales are a certain, below a certain amount, you can get some of the business and occupation tax deducted. Um, do you need to pay other uh, categories like litter tax and utilities taxes? What is, you know, all the different things that might pertain to your industry? And so even if you don't have to collect and pay sales tax, you're going to still have to pay business and occupation tax. So you need to know what your category is and what the rate is because that portion is coming out of your pocket. Okay? Do I know how to audit proof my business? Quite a few years ago, I took a class that was given by a CPA and it was eye opening. The things that he taught us, how you can write things off as business expenses, and you would be going, no way. But it's really wonderful because if you know the rules and you know how to properly document everything and keep, uh, maintain a good accounting system, then you can write off a lot more things than most people realize. So you also want to make your business audit proof for, um, for, for example, if the IRS comes in and audits you, they may be looking for, say, um, somebody you hired as a subcontractor and they'll, they'll go, ah, oh, no, this guy's really an employee. He, you have to pay back payroll taxes on this person. Or if the Department of Revenue comes in and looks at, and audits your books, they may say, hmm, we want to make sure that, you know, you paid sales tax on all these pieces of equipment you purchased. And there's different things that different agencies look for. So one of the things you need to know is which ones look for what and how do I prevent that from falling through the cracks where I might end up getting caught, you know, making a poor choice. One common mistake I see so many people make, they say, oh, I keep my credit card statements and my bank statements and it shows where I've spent all my money. That's not good enough. They want to see the actual receipts. They want to see what you bought, did you pay sales tax, and then what's the total. Okay, did you buy this stuff at Home Depot and it was really personal? And did you pay tax on it? So it depends on who's looking at it. The other thing, you know, in the last probably 10 years, those thermal receipts, okay, they fade. Well, usually you're not going to get audited for a few years. And you go back and you pull out all your old records and open them up and they're all blank. If it's important enough to keep, you should be scanning it or photocopying it because those thermal papers will not save you. Okay, next one. What kind of accounting system should I use? Well, I prefer QuickBooks. I've been working with it for 19 years, and it is used by 92% of small businesses in the, in the country. Um, it's a very good program. It's easy to use. And um, as long as it's set up properly, you can use it, you know, forever. It's wonderful. And like I said, I, I've taught this at Green River for 14 years. I've worked with a lot of people who don't really know anything about accounting, but they know their business really well, and um, we teach them how to, how to get it set up and how to use it and do it accurately. Um, there are a lot of people out there will uh, say, oh, yeah, I know QuickBooks. I can set your books up for you. Um, be careful. Oops. What professional advice should I seek to successfully start and operate my business? Well, the hint, get professional advice during your startup to avoid costly mistakes. Um, like the gentleman I told you about who was on a ca accrual basis instead of cash. Um, like Clinton talked about, make sure you're the right entity. And a lot of people think, oh, that's too much, too expensive to hire somebody to come and tell me what to do. Well, don't think of it as an expense. Think of, of it as an investment in your business. And then I just had some suggestions. Always be proactive in researching your industry and your competitors. What's working for them, what's not working for them? What can you offer your customers that your competitor can't? Don't be afraid to ask for professional guidance and have a team of experts already set up. This is financial planners, bankers, um, accountants, attorneys, um, any kind of special um, uh, professional advice you might need. And no business, not just your business, 
in the last 19 years, I have seen so many businesses fail because somebody gets irritated and says, you know what, I'm tired of working for that guy. I'm going to go into business for myself. Mm -hmm. And they're really good at whatever they do, but they don't know how to run a business. They don't know all the rules and regulations and things like that. And so it's really important that before you dive into that pool, make sure there's water in it. Make sure you know what you're doing. <laughs> Identify your strengths and weaknesses that could cont contribute to your success or failure. Okay, you know what your weaknesses are. You know what your strengths are. If it's something that you, you know how to do, but you just don't like it, and you're going to post, you know, put it off and, and you may get yourself in trouble, find somebody else to delegate it to. Find somebody that loves to do that and have them work with you on that. Okay, develop procedures and schedules for all aspects of your business. Now, this is something that Tim talked about, is having an organized plan, setting up your internal systems. Um, it's very important to help you stay organized and avoid problems such as missed deadlines, lost sales, missed appointments, and customer follow-ups. Okay, um, paying your taxes is one of them. Um, so when I, when I work with QuickBooks clients, one of the things we do is we set up memor memorized transactions. So if you're afraid you're going to forget to make your credit card payment, well, set it up for automatic. So you don't have to stop what you're doing, go pay your credit card bill, and then, you know, worry about late fees and all that. Set things up to be automated and set up a system that's going to work for you. Um, one of the things you want to do is identify the cracks that, where things can fall through. And then it's going to be a constant um, work in progress that you're going to be adjusting your systems so you don't have any of these issues come up. If you already have started your business, it's never too late to get your accounting records on track. I've worked with a lot of businesses. They, they contact me after several years and they say, I need help. It's a mess. What do I do? Um, it is not that big of a problem to get things cleaned up. It may be time consuming, but it's not difficult. And one of the things that, um, at least with the QuickBooks um, clients I work with, is very, very seldom do you ever want to start over. Okay? It's better to clean up what you have. If you stop and start over and start a new set of books, that can cause more issues. So you don't want to do that. So you want to choose, choose success over failure, but the most important thing is to have fun in your business. You're doing this because you're passionate about what the type of business you, are, you have, what you want to do. So you want to make sure you're having fun at it. Yep, I'm on to the next one. Okay. So I uh, look forward to the Q&A session. And um, oh, also, if anybody is interested in that list of 10 things, um, I do have it available on our website at fbc-cpa.com. And it's under the Resources tab. So if you wanted to print off a copy of that, go to our website. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Our final presenter is going to be Melanie Norton who is with the U.S. Um, Small Business Administration. Uh, Melanie has been, is an economic development specialist for the SBA out of the Seattle District Office and covers this area of South King County, working to promote the agency's brands and services, marketing and outreach, outreach team. Uh, before coming to the SBA, she led uh, all the marketing and media communications activity for the U.S. Peace Corps on the West Coast. She also has had um, uh, lengthy stints in communication experience with several advertising agencies and nonprofits. Uh, she's going to be speaking to us on show us the money. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Who is the SBA? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. I'm um, really glad to be here this afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. I'm glad you made it out. It's very important to invest in your business, and I think this is a great opportunity to learn more about different tips and resources that are available to um, help you out because you have a lot on your plates as a small business owner. Um, so like Doug said, my name is Melanie Norton. I'm with the U.S. Small Business Administration Seattle District Office. Um, the SBA is a federal agency, federal government agency, and the Seattle District covers Washington State and Northern Idaho. 
Um, so essentially what we do is we help businesses start, grow, and succeed. And we've been doing that for more than 60 years. Um, and so you can kind of see from the slide our um, new tagline or marchingers, if you will, is that SBA doesn't just stand for Small Business Administration. It stands for um, smart, bold, and accessible. Um, and I'm especially going to talk about that accessibility part, uh, making sure that um, we're out in the communities, out talking to business owners, um, so we can make sure that you are getting access to the resources and services that can um, help you improve your business. Um, so how we primarily do that, and actually um, another thing too with that, um, I actually heard someone say once that um, there's no such thing as too much information, there's just filter failure, um, which has anyone ever encountered a problem or question and went to Google it and just was overwhelmed by the results. Um, what the SBA, what we want to try to do is we want to help with that filter. <laughs> so you don't have to have filter failure, we want to help um, you find and easily and quickly connect to the resource or service that's going to help you with whatever particular stage or problem or question you might have with your business. So um, with that, um, we primarily focus on what we refer to as the three C's at the SBA. Um, that's capital, counseling, and contracting. Um, so I'm actually going to talk first about the counseling arm. Um, we have an extension of it right here with Kirk in the room. Um, and a lot of things I'm going to be talking about today are, um, there's more details about them in our resource guide, which is on the table or available on our website. Um, so definitely if you didn't pick one up, please feel free to do that or utilize our electronic copy on our website if you're more of an electronic um, search and a PDF type of person. Um, so counseling arm, we provide free one-on-one -on -one business counseling through our three resource partners. Did I mention it's free? Mm -hmm. It's free. <laughs> so um, our three partners, the Small Business Development Centers, which um, Kirk Davis is one of the advisors through the Small Business Development Centers. Um, SCORE, which SCORE is an organization of volunteers, of retired, current business executives, small business owners, various business experts that volunteer to provide that free one-on-one -on -one business counseling and advising to small businesses. And then we also have three women's business centers throughout um, Washington State in Seattle, um, Lacey down in Thurston County, and in Spokane and Easter Washington. So all three provide free one-on-one -on -one business counseling um, to small business owners, whether you're in that startup stage, um, you're getting ready to grow, take your business to the next level, um, whatever it may be, there's um, counselors that are available. And that is such a huge, huge, huge um, asset. Um, they're able to do that for free, um, partly through funding from SBA and other uh, resource partners, but definitely take advantage of it. Kind of um, what Maria was saying, it's kind of nice to get something set up the right way in the beginning or as quickly as possible. Um, we often talk to business owners who say, gosh, I wish I knew about this six months ago or last year when I was setting things up. So definitely um, don't hesitate and take advantage of those counselors. Um, they also provide some um, business classes along with um, the SBA and um, all the SBA courses um, are that the SBA hosts and puts on are free. Um, and we also try to provide information about other free resources, classes, workshops, webinars that are provided. For example, the one that you're sitting in right here today through the city of Auburn, we're going to be posting some of their future series on our website um, because we really, since we are a federal agency, we want to try to provide that safe learning environment, sort of that no, no cell zone, if you will. Um, so oftentimes you can come in and know that you're getting free unbiased education for small business owners. Um, and actually we were talking, um, Kirk was talking about the um, research part, how there, there's a lot of resources at your library that are free and accessible with a library card. It's funny he should mention that because tomorrow, if um, you want to pick up a blue flyer, um, part of our workshop series that we offer, we are having a DIY market research that's being put on by the Seattle Public Library, which has connections with the King County Library System. So if you want to learn more about what Kirk was talking about and have a business resource librarian actually walk you through some of the different um, databases and how you can get that information, um, tomorrow afternoon we're going to have that. And that's just one example of the type of classes we try to provide for free by bringing in experts. Um, you sort of have heard the saying that it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes a community to support a small business. So um, everyone in this room and a lot more are invested in that. And so we try to work together with them. 
Um, so some of those workshops are another example of the counseling services we provide. Um, um, so those are going on on an ongoing basis, also available on our website, the www.sba.gov slash WA for Washington. There's a handy little calendar there that you can see what's coming up, not only from SBA, but other partners um, in the community. And um, a couple top level um, counseling or educational opportunities that are coming up that I will just kind of note so you can maybe put a little um, mark in your calendar that they're coming up. Um, May, the first week of May is um, National Small Business Week. And so in conjunction with National Small Business Week, we always do what we call our Jumpstart Week, uh, where we have a full week all day of free classes such, um, such as this. And so they offer topics from um, a marketing day where we have a session on social media or using customer service as a selling tool, putting together a marketing plan, a finance day, those three statements that um, Ray was talking about, how to get a more in-depth knowledge of those, um, putting together a business plan, some of the fundamentals, different topics like that, um, and again, free courses. So that's coming up in May as part of National Small Business Week. Um, and a second one that I'm going to mention because um, it's actually prime time that um, we're here today talking about it, it's our um, SBA Emerging Leaders Program. And so this is something I think it's going to be the sixth year now. We're just going to be starting the um, application process for this program, but Emerging Leaders is a mini MBA program, if you will, that SBA puts on. Um, it's free, and it's a seven-month course, so you meet uh, about every other week for three hours, and it's a miniature MBA program. It takes, and it's specifically targeted for businesses that are um, poised for growth. Um, so not a startup, but you've been around for a few years or maybe you're encountering a big transition. We've had several family businesses that are passing from one generation to the next. Next generation is taking over, ready to move into that CEO position. Um, but the program will take you through planning, take you through understanding your financials, through sales and marketing. Um, an in-depth class of 15 small business owners. And at the end of this program, um, where you've been able to take time out of your schedule to work on your business instead of in your business, which is really huge and something that you all value because you're in the room today. Um, and at the end, you'll walk away with a three-year strategic growth action plan. Um, and during the course, we bring in a variety of experts, so you get some one-on-one -on -one time with CPAs, with um, marketing consultants, with human resources lawyers, all different types of um, experts and resources, and it's taught by um, a CEO, coach, and former small business owner who is outstanding. Uh, she's actually so good that she's training a lot of the other trainers that are doing the program in other states. So we're really lucky here in the Seattle, greater Seattle area. So um, that's gonna, we're going to start taking applications for that soon since there's a lot of existing small business owners in the room. I definitely wanted to mention that because, you know, it's more of a time commitment. It's not a one-hour webinar, but... Um, we're seeing a lot of our businesses that are doing really well. And in fact, a couple of our graduates from last year have already surpassed their three years and are having to create new year plans because things are moving um, so quickly. We're seeing a lot of success out of it. So definitely check that out. Um, so again, a lot of uh, things under the counseling arm, and a lot of them are free. A lot of people and organizations dedicated to helping you out there. Um, so I'll move on to the second C, capital, money. It's a little, little important in businesses, right? Something that um, we all need. Um, so most cases when um, most people have heard of the SBA, it's usually in conjun conjunction with their SBA loan program. So um, just to kind of clarify what the SBA loan program is, uh, the SBA does not give loans directly to businesses. Rather, we provide guarantees to lenders to mitigate their risk, to enable them to provide loans to small businesses in circumstances where they might not be able to otherwise. So I'll, I'll say that again. <laughs> we, um, we don't provide the loans directly to the small businesses, but we provide a guarantee to lenders so that they can, um, it mitigates their, ri their risk and enables them to provide loans to small businesses in circumstances where they might not otherwise be able to. Um, so we work um, with the Seattle District Office. We work with um, probably close to 100 lenders throughout the district, so mostly the state of Washington and northern Idaho, and those are banks, credit unions, micro lenders, um, certified development companies, a variety of different lenders. 
um, to provide a guarantee. And so our um, in most common situation, our 7A loan is our most commonly used loan program. Um, and in that, you can receive up to an 85% guarantee. So, um, and in some cases, depending on the type of loan, there's a variety of programs. Some are specifically for veterans. Um, some are microloan programs, small loan programs. Um, we see that most businesses don't need million dollar loans. They might need just 100,000, 150,000, just something to um, kind of get them to the next level. Um, so for all these different loan programs that are available, and we definitely have some in-depth information on our website. Again, website is a wealth of information, and I can help um, help filter down where you can find that information if you're interested. Um, for example, there's exporting loans too. So you can get on exporting loans, you can get up to a 90% guarantee, which if you're a bank, if you're a lender, and you're looking at a small business, and you can have up to 90% of that loan guaranteed. So if for whatever reason, worst case scenario, something goes wrong, and you as the small business are unable to pay back the bank for that loan, and they have a 90% guarantee, meaning the SBA will pay up to 90% of that loan, that's minimizing their risk quite a bit. And so they're, they're definitely going to be more inclined to say yes. Um, so again, it's a real helpful tool. It's um, something we try to use to um, help small businesses in circumstances where it's a very close situation, where the, the bank or the lender might say, hey, this looks good, but maybe you just don't have enough collateral or maybe you're a new business, and so you don't have that um, history to demonstrate that you're a profitable business. Um, I think approximately one out of four of our small business loans go to businesses that are in that first couple years. Um, so that's a situation where an SBA loan or guarantee can help out because it's, again, mitigating that risk to the lender. Um, maybe credit history. Um, we've had a lot of people, especially with um, different circumstances, coming out of a bad economy or um, maybe your credit score isn't as high as you would like it to be because there was a medical situation. You had a lot of medical bills to pay for a while. Again, if you can tell that story and using, that's where the counseling comes into play as well, sitting down with some of the different counselors and advisors to help tell that story to the potential lender before you walk in the door so you can um, have that package put together, have all their questions answered. Um, again, we all kind of work together so we can... Um, make sure that we are getting the best situation for you to be successful. Um, so that's a little bit about the, the loan program. Again, it's um, a tool that can help you get some, um, some financials through, through loans in situations where um, it might be close, but no cigar. But um, we can kind of help to, to get you over that hump with that. Um, and then the third C is our contracting, so helping small businesses get access to government contracts. Um, so the federal government, the U.S. government, um, they are the biggest customer in the world. They spend billions and billions of dollars every year on everything from paper clips to airplane parts. Um, and so someone's going to provide those. They're buying them from someone. And so we want to see as many of those contracts going into the hands of small businesses as possible. So um, because of that, we have quite a few different government contracting programs to help get as much of that business into the hands of small businesses as possible. So some of the ones that are administered, and there's different levels. There's the federal government. There's state government. Um, there's local government. Um, regional government, so there's all different levels that you can do government contracting. Some of the SBA-specific programs focus more on the federal end, just given that it's a federal agency. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity with um, different military bases that are in our region, JBLM, Bremerton, there's some different places nearby where um, some of the programs that, the certification programs we have can um, help small businesses get their foot in the door when it comes to doing business with the government, since it's a little different world of business compared to business to business or business to consumer. Um, so a couple of those, um, you can get different certifications, whether you are, there's just a small business certification, so just the fact that you're a small business, you can get a certification, and there's certain set-asides for that. Women-owned small business, um, veteran small businesses, veteran disabled small businesses, um, minority or historically underserved small businesses. Um, there's even a what we call a hub zone, which is a historically underutilized business zone. 
Um, so it could just be the fact that your business and most of your employees are located in an area that um, based on Census Bureau information is considered a historically underutilized business zone. Um, and so that you can actually type in your exact address. Some of it it's by county, like for example, um, I think Grays Harbor and Lewis counties, the entire county is a hub zone. Um, sometimes it's just neighborhoods or pockets within a zip code. So I know that there's a couple around Pierce. Um, so it doesn't hurt to look because those are areas where um, government contractors are actively seeking small businesses to do this work for them that have some of these different certifications. So um, if it's the right fit and we work with um, what we call PTACs, um, that stands for Procurement Technical Assistance Center. So um, they're essentially very similar to what Kirk and some of the other advisors do, but their specialty is in government contracting. Um, so they can sit down, help you decide, is doing business with the government right for me? What's the market research specific? What's the government buying? Are they buying what I'm selling? Um, what's the historical numbers? Who are they currently buying from? When is there going to be another contract up for bid? Um, some of that information, they can kind of help you. The same process you would go through with your business in um, the business sector, but how it translates into the government sector. So um, again, those are the three Cs that we primarily focus on. We have some kind of auxiliary programs like disaster loans. For example, when there was the mudslides up in the Oso area last year, wildfires, throughout the state this past summer. We provide disaster assistance loans to small businesses who were affected by some different natural disasters. <coughs> um, we also have a, an advocate. So if um, you're having a, a problem and it's maybe something that's not just unique to your business, but a particular area, or maybe within the industry, you and other small businesses are having um, a challenge that you would like to have your voice heard, we have an advocate that We'll also listen to those, which can also help because, again, you're busy <laughs> looking at your financial statements and doing payroll and um, many other hats. So that's another way that we can help um, voice an opinion. And since um, the SBA is an independent federal agency, we answer directly to the White House. Um, so we kind of have some shorter lines of communication to get some of those concerns heard um, from the small business owners. So, again, there's different things that we can um, do there to help you out. So this was just sort of a, a quick summary of um, the different things we focus on. But if there's one thing that you take away from today, I would add a fourth C to our three Cs, and that's connected. So um, stay connected with us. Um, so up here is um, all the information, um, and my, my business card is available too. But um, again, our website, uh, sba.gov slash WA for Washington. Um, probably the best and easiest way, if there's one action item you took away from um, from my presentation, subscribe to the SBA Reporter. That's our weekly newsletter that goes out um, every Wednesday morning, and it's put, produced by our local office, so it's specifically geared toward um, services, resources, success stories, everything that's out of this district. So you're going to have event notices, um, news, trends, um, different success stories from different businesses, tips. Um, kind of some of those filter failure tips where, hey, did you know that this is available? Or um, kind of that you don't know what you don't know. So we try to provide different information about um, services and resources that are available. Um, I think one great example we worked with um, through Washington State, they have a program, a shared work program. So for example, if you had a coffee shop and business is going well, you have some good employees, and then suddenly construction goes up on your street. And it's kind of blocking the entrance to get into your coffee shop. And so for the next year when construction's going on, you're really struggling. And you have good employees. You don't want to let them go. But you just don't have the sales during this short-term particular problem to get through it. There's programs to the state where um, you can cut back on your employees' hours, but they can help complement the um, salary that you'll have to deduct. So your employees get to take home the same paycheck you get to reduce their hours so you can save some money until um, construction goes away and business picks up again. Um, and then you can kind of, it's, it's similar to unemployment, but not quite, but it's specific. They call it a shared work program for some of those temporary situations. I mean, really cool programs that how on earth would you know that was out there? Because I work in government and I still don't know every single department that exists throughout there. So how on earth would a business owner know that? Well, that's what we try to do is go out, mine those different resources, and um, put them in your inbox once a week in a very easy way. So 
Um, that's my one pitch. That's the one action item. I know, homework, when you come to something like this. But hopefully it's an easy one. Um, and so and then our address, we're located right in downtown Seattle, my contact information. Um, again, the website has a wealth of information, but I think our newsletter is a great way to stay abreast of some of the different things I talked about today. And, um, you know, again, that accessible part of um, a we're accessible, please feel free to call me, email me, uh, come up and talk to me, ask me some questions in a few minutes. Um, we're all here to support you. We're, our staff is filled with former business, small business owners, or we've worked for small business owners. We all are customers of small businesses. Um, we want to see you succeed. So please um, reach out to us, and we're going to do what we can to help you. So thank you for allowing me to talk to you today. Thank you, Melanie. That was very, very good. Um, we're going to move into this point in the program right now where we're going to open it up for a little while on question and answer. Uh, we've got, uh, obviously, a list of all the speakers' names again. So we have a young lady here. Barb is going to come around with the microphone and just raise your hand and we'll uh, uh, pose your question and to who you're asking it for. Do we have any questions? This question is for Melanie. I'm Laura from the Downtown Association. That shared work program, is that a loan from the government or is it more like unemployment where it's, I mean, how, how does that work? You know, um, I could, if you want to um, get me your, your email, I can send you the article because they have a video and some information. I don't know it off the top of my head, but I could locate it and send it to you and so it'd have those details. Actually, I can answer that for you. I was a former HR director and used the program oh, during perfect. the downturn in the economy. And so, no, it is not a loan. It works with uh, the state through Employment Security Department. And what it does is it allows you to maintain your employees. You reduce their hours. The reporting is really important there. And where they supplement is they supplement through um, the unemployment insurance really is, is what it has. Now, it's not a dollar-for-dollar dollar match. So your employees... Will will maintain some salary, but it isn't the full the full deal. But it really does help through through some tough times. Yes, sir. We use uh, the uh, the program, the shared work program, through the recession, and uh, it goes for a period of time. And there is substantial reporting on the hours and whatnot. But what your employees end up with on the deal is is there's a differential between their 40-hour work week and what they actually worked. And if, say, there's a 10-hour difference, they get paid a portion of that. They don't get paid all of it by any means. The bad news for the employer on, the, on this particular program is, is that it goes against your experience rating, and you'll pay for it for the next five years. Mm -hmm. So um, it's good to get you through and help you maintain and retain your, your key people. And we actually did that. All of our key people still work for us. Um, but um, we're paying for it right now. We just got our new... We're on the downhill side of it now, but um, we've still got about two more years to work that off. So just FYI. Up front here. Rich? difference between oh thanks between a LLC and a PLLC a PLLC is a professional LLC that's going to be reserved for businesses like lawyers doctors uh, professional engineers companies like that where they are licensed through the state but it's a, it's an actual professional license not just an occupational license like you'd find in some other professions like barbers and cosmetologists and things like that is there any liability differences? Um, not so much a question of liability differences, but for some of the, those professions, if you are set up as a professional limited liability company, I know like with, with attorneys, one of the requirements that the statute then has is we are then required to carry, I believe it's still a million dollars in uh, E&O coverage to have that professional limited liability company versus a professional corporation like we have with the PS. And then my next, my next question is for Melanie. <laughs> um, 
I live in the architectural world, and the small business threshold, I believe, is 7.1 million right now, mm -hmm. which is a huge architectural business. Is there anything to get that more realistic so natural small business has a shot? <laughs> in terms of the size standards that yes. you're talking about? Um, that would probably be a good question um, that I can connect you with our regional advocate because um, I think that the Office of Advocacy works on updating those size standards. Um, so that would be the starting place that I could connect you in. Yeah, so I'll, um, <laughs> yeah, make sure I'll get you my card and I can connect you with her about how we can better address that. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Questions? There we go. Um, from uh, from Mr. Wilcox, do you recommend operating a family business through a trust? No. Okay. Can you explain why? <laughs> um, well, I, I think Maria can tell you that trusts operate on a different tax structure, and usually that curve is a lot steeper for for trust than it is for corporations or partnerships. But the other reason is. If you ever go to sell the business or somebody comes to buy the business, it's not always a decision that you make. Sometimes you have the offer fall into your lap. Uh, you're going to have a whole different set of headaches and troubles in working through a trust than you will with a corporation or an, or an LLC. Okay. And then what about the um, social venture capital model where you have the for-profit business that feeds, I guess, their tax deduction money into a nonprofit? Can you speak to you know, I, I've read a little bit about them, but I really haven't done a lot of research on them. Okay. So that my honest answer is I really can't speak to it very much. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions at this time from the audience? Okay. We're going to um, a couple of things I want to uh, point out. This program, uh, starting in January, was Business 101 uh, Workshop. This is a series of... Um, programs we're going to do uh, and offer throughout uh, 2015. Our idea was that we would use this platform and as an introductory panel of all the different pieces of the puzzle of, of starting a new business or, or expanding your existing one. So in February, for example, uh, that program is going to be specifically on developing a business plan. And Kirk is going to be back and a couple other panelists and they're going to drill through down into the detail of, of developing a business plan, not just an, a 15 minute overview. Um, March is going to be on finance and legal and accounting. Going to get in a lot deeper on corporate finance, business finance and, and accounting and that type of stuff. Um, in April, uh, March, or excuse me, in April, we're going to uh, how to do business with the government. You know, the SBA is going to be a big partner in that. We'll have somebody here from probably the state and the county on how to you as a small business can access and what you have to do, you know, like for doing business with the city of Auburn, um, particularly in the professional area and accounting and engineering services. We open it up once every two years and develop a list of, of companies that are on that list to be notified of RFPs when they come out. Um, marketing and uh, June will be interesting at that point I think we're going to get drilled down into um, uh, human resources and insurance uh, issues that's a big deal on hiring and what you go through in those areas so throughout the year we're going to do um, more in-depth drilled down uh, type programming so we hope you can join us uh, for those in the upcoming months this program and uh, the following ones will be oh will be edited and uh, made available on our website through the City of Auburn. And that will, uh, uh, we maintain these videos so you can go back and refer to them if you have questions. And uh, hopefully that will be a resource in a lot of companies that can't make it off during the day. Uh, we get uh, quite a bit of activity on those programs. I've got my mouse back. I'm dangerous. Um, Again, uh, in the back of the room, we have copies of today's program. There is a complete speakers list with their complete bios and all of their contact information, how you can reach them if you have a direct question, um, and quite a bit of other material either supplied by them or here on the City of 
Auburn. If there's anything that we can do to help in the future, um, our contact is obviously quite available and we're here to help. And we want to thank you for being here. And our speakers will be around for a little while here afterwards for some one-on-one -on -one if you have some questions. Thank you for attending.